goodness. Morning time again. Put the coffee in there. Get it ground. Get it made. Okay, right here. And here. Alright, I like to do what's called cafe au lait, which is basically coffee with a lot of milk. In some cases, people will insist, no, that has to be steamed milk. You know what, when I put that coffee down in there, it'll be steaming just fine. Just a little bit of sugar to knock the edge off. There we go. Hello, good morning. I wanted to do a uh, another video, <coughs> pardon me, allergies right now. I wanted to do another video on developing the palate. Um, this is something that now that I've gotten started, I really wanted to kind of follow through on. Um, let me explain what I mean. I've done several videos now on developing the palate. Uh, we discussed the basics, which is discover new foods and find out what they taste like. Find out what their texture is like. Find out how they're normally cooked. Okay. Then we moved into another phase of that, which is you have all of these flavors outside of just your regular complement of food items. Let's put these to use and learn what they taste like and learn how do they relate to each other. Okay, and then we get into compounding flavors and um, the growth experience by that and once you learn how to put different flavors together that work well with each other uh, and how you that pushes you forward well also then we go into the the discussion on the use of alcohol and now I want to take what we've learned what we've picked up from all of that and turn that into how do we go from uh, development, understanding of those ingredients and training that palate, how do we go from that development to practical application? How do we apply what we've learned in all of this? So that's what I wanted to get into today. That's what this is all about. Uh, this is about developing the palate and then being able to make dishes or reverse engineer dishes or what have you from what we've learned. And we're going to start with the reverse engineering because I think that is one of the best ways for you to teach yourself flavors is to be able to duplicate somebody else's work. Can you do it? Now when I say duplicate someone else's work, I don't mean go on YouTube, which you're on now, please go on YouTube and watch, but I'm not referring to taking a video from YouTube, let's say Chef Ramsay's Beef Wellington, and making that, because it only applies if you've actually been in his restaurant and you've tasted his Beef Wellington. What I'm talking about is taking dishes that you know, dishes that you love, dishes from restaurants that you go to, and being able to reproduce those with accurate results. That's what we're talking about here, that kind of re reverse engineering. I've tasted it, I now can reproduce it. And sometimes it takes a little study. Okay, this is where we get into advanced cooking. <clears throat> advanced cooking is about understanding not only the flavors in the dish that you're eating. Ooh, I detect basil in this. Oh, I can, I can taste that this has chilies in it. Mm, this must have cheese. I taste that flavor. So going from that to this obviously has about X amount of this ingredient in here. And we arrive at these conclusions in multiple ways. So I'm in the restaurant. We're going to start with that scenario. I'm sitting there. I'm eating my dish. I look at the food that's been presented to me. Okay. Now let's start with um, 
What would be a good one here? Camarones a la Diabla. I'll use that for an example. Now what that means is that is shrimp in a devil sauce, okay? And the sauce itself is actually a chipotle sauce. That's what most restaurants use. A restaurant that I love going to makes a really good uh, Diabla sauce, and I love it. They do big shrimp that are grilled, and they top it with this banging good sauce, and it is spectacular good. Now here's the thing. I can reproduce that. I've made that sauce at home for myself. And it is fantastic. I love doing it. Um, and that's because this is one of my favorite dishes. I love that shrimp with chipotle sauce. It's just really, really good. So how did I arrive at knowing how he made it? Well, first of all, it had to do with knowing my techniques. Okay, so I know how to make a, a chili paste or a chili sauce. Um, you know, so there's where it starts then knowing what flavors come behind that. In his, I can detect the flavor of garlic, but understand something, I don't detect the flavor of fresh garlic because he doesn't have that in there. I detect the flavor of powdered garlic. And I'm not complaining, the two are distinct and separate flavors. Uh, and one isn't bad and the other good, they're just different. I like powdered garlic and that's what I put in mine instead of fresh. And that way I can duplicate someone else's sauce. There's other things they put in it. There's some salt. Um, there is um, some cum uh, cumin, comino. And these flavors, once they're cooked up the right way, you duplicate what you've eaten. Now, I wouldn't be able to duplicate that sauce I would just be able to make a chipotle sauce had I never tasted that sauce. But now that I've tasted it and I want it again, I want to be able to make it at home. And so I did that. I reverse engineered that sauce. Uh, grilling the shrimp is easy enough. Let me give you another example. This is another Mexican dish and I'm going to use these examples um, not because you're familiar with them but because I'm intimately familiar with them. I, uh, another dish that I really enjoy, but I can't have it very often because it has an ingredient that I'm allergic to. Uh, and that's a dish called polo con hangos. And that would be chicken in mushrooms uh, or chicken with mushrooms. Polo con hangos is Spanish and that means chicken with mushrooms. The dish is often served as a grilled chicken with a creamy mushroom sauce that has poblanos or other kinds of chilies cooked up in it. They're delicious. It's a fantastic dish and it really should be enjoyed. If you've never tasted it, please give it a shot. Um, the first time I had this dish, I was floored. I loved it. And I immediately tasted and knew each of the ingredients that were in it only because I have a trained palate. All right, so <clears throat> first of all, they bring me the plate and I see it, it's just chicken, it's grilled, it's on top of the sauce, which is you know, these mushrooms and, and, and chili peppers and you can see the, the creaminess of the sauce, so you know it's cream. And when you taste it, you immediately know that it's some form of cream that has been soured or cultured is what we call it. Um, in the United States, we call it sour cream, French creme fraiche, uh, the Spanish, um, crema and um, so we take that that cultured cream mix it in with mushrooms and, and, and chilies that have been cooked and suddenly we get this fantastic sauce down there and that was what they served to me and so I first I use my eyes I can see what's going on I see there's mushrooms I see there's pepper strips I see it so I know how to construct it but now it's a matter of tasting it and finding out was that chicken marinated. The one I first had was not. Um, it's good to marinate them, but you don't have to. Then I get to the sauce, and of course there's mushrooms there, and I push them to the side because, well, I can eat dishes with them in there, but if I eat too many mushrooms, I'm itching. I'm allergic to them, so I can't eat mushrooms that very often. 
Um, but I love the flavors that go on with it. And I also love the flavor of the chili in the dish. It just, they contrast well with the mushrooms and they pop together. Uh, and a cream sauce helps to really tame any intensity of the chili, you know, like from heat, it helps tame that down. So there we have a layout of reverse engineering polo con hongos. Now for me, I changed it. I took out the mushrooms, okay, for obvious reasons. I renamed my dish Creamy Chicken Poblano. And so now I have this whole new dish that I evolved from a wonderful flavor that I found in a restaurant. So that's how you take it, reverse engineer it, and then turn it into your own. I took the mushrooms out. I pan sear uh, poblano strips. I use more of them and make a really strong poblano-y tasting uh, cream sauce. And I use sour cream. And sometimes I'll add a little heavy cream to that to thin it if necessary. And uh, I add that cream at the end of the cooking of the poblanos. I pan sear them and mix it all together, bring the cream up in temperature, let it cook just for a moment, and then plate it up with my grilled chicken breast. And, and I get this magnificent dish. It's delicious. It's memorable. It's exciting, and it's something you just want to eat again and again. So there I have a beautiful dish that started in a restaurant, got reverse engineered, then got changed. It's now mine, and I present that on my videos. Now, I have that on Texas Cooking Today, that recipe. There's the reverse engineering side of it. Now, let's, let's take a look at a little different approach to putting this in action. Okay, sorry about the, uh, the, the picture. I'm hand-holding this thing and it weighs a ton. All right, I'm about to head to my friend's restaurant. I'm gonna get some wonderful tasting food, and then we're gonna take a look at that, come back, and reconstruct it bit by bit. This is gonna be so fun. Come on. You have seen the beautiful recipe that I'm about to do. Um, I went over to a restaurant that I love going to, and um, I'll frequent this place maybe once every other month. So about six times a year, I would say. Uh, I don't mind giving the name of the restaurant out, and before I do that, though, I need to mention it's not paid, okay? So I'm not endorsed or anything like that. But I think it's fair to say this, this guy's name because he has worked hard and he has held standards uh, constant in his restaurant. And that, that's a hard thing to do, is, is to produce a dish exactly the same way each and every time someone comes in. And he's able to do that. Because um, frequently when I, when I latch onto a recipe in his restaurant, I'll have it at least three to four times, sometimes more. Uh, so certain dishes I really like there, and he does shrimp remarkably well. Um, but anyway, the name of this restaurant, uh, if you're ever visiting Dallas, excuse me, if you're ever visiting Dallas, the name of this restaurant is Mario's. It's uh, on Lemon Avenue, and uh, definitely worth your time to take a look at. It's uh, a favorite spot of mine. If you happen to go there, mention to the owner, Mario, that you heard about the place right here okay so please enjoy that if you get a chance and uh, so what we're going to be doing is duplicating the dish that you just saw now I'm not going to get it exactly the same I don't want the same amount of vegetables I don't necessarily like that blend of vegetables I don't do carrots and mushrooms in my in my vegetables so I'll probably to put with this probably do a rice dish and a um, um, some pan seared broccoli uh, so it'll be something to that effect what I'm trying to duplicate is that sauce the sauce that makes that shrimp special you can cook the shrimp any number of ways you can just toss it in a pan with some oil and uh, cook it up that way you could 
put it on a skewer, put it on the grill, do it that way. Um, so the shrimp could be cooked in whichever manner you want. On this dish, what really is af affecting the dish is the sauce. So what we need to do is to duplicate that. Now, if you wanted to just cheat, you know, let's say you're, you're, you go to a restaurant and you tried to this dish and you wanted to just cheat and say, oh, I don't, I don't want to duplicate it, I just want something similar. You could probably like go out and get something like this. Get you a chipotle sauce, you know, empty it out of the bottle, uh, heat it up, don't heat it in the bottle, um, and you'd probably get a decent dish, all right? So if you just wanted a quick workaround, that would be one thing you could do, but you know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about developing the palate. We're talking about being able to pick out what flavors are there and to duplicate that from taste, not from what we read on a label or from a list of ingredients. And that takes skill. Now, when I was at the restaurant, and uh, by the way, that was yesterday. This is next day. This is in the morning. I'm um, enjoying my coffee. And I like to sleep on things like this. It, it really helps me to think about what I tasted and then to approach it the next day. And besides, I don't want the same dish twice in one day. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Um, there was th three distinct flavors that spoke to me when I was tasting his dish. I could taste some sort of a chicken broth background. So I was pretty sure that he used some sort of a uh, chicken stock of some kind um, in the production of this. It did taste of chipotle, so he had some chipotle peppers in there. Whether he added it in the form of a sauce or if he was using fresh peppers, I don't know. I could not discern that. But there was chipotle in his sauce. The flavor of garlic was there, but it was light. It wasn't distinct or in the foreground. It was in the background and it was light. So chicken broth light in the background, garlic light in the background, distinctly the flavor of chilies. Um, now, chipotle is normally made with jalapeno. And uh, so that's what you have is you have a, have a jalapeno pepper that's been smoked and then they dry it and boom, you've got a chipotle. Um, the things in the can, that's not what a sauce like this is made from. So uh, that's a totally different thing. That's just a smoked um, jalapeno that's then been canned with some sauce from another kind of chili, <laughs> which is weird, an adobo sauce. But <clears throat> in reconstructing his sauce, those distinct flavors, the chili flavor, uh, which wasn't specific to a chili, but just distinctly a chili flavor, and then the smokiness of chipotle present, so you knew the chipotle chilies were there. And um, so the thing of it, it, was, it, it wasn't strictly chipotle by itself. There's other chili there that was tempering it. And one of the reasons I know that there was another kind of chili in this sauce was the color. Um, chipotle is brown, okay, and I've got, I've got a bag of them here. We're going to be uh, opening these up in a little bit and looking at them, but when you make a sauce from chipotle, it comes out dark brown, okay? It's just in the nature of the chili, okay? But his sauce has, had red in it, which told me he probably used Colorado chilies or um, Hatch chilies or possibly California chilies, um, which are, by the way, those are chilies that are made from um, the Anaheim chili. That, that's when you dry in Anaheim, those are what you get. And depending on region, or in the case of the Hatch, which is a New Mexico product, that's, um, you know, sort of its own, own thing there. But those are Anaheim chilies. Uh, I chose a chili that was made from the Marisol chili. Now when you take a Marisol chili and you dry it, you get uh, what's called a Guajillo chili, which is a beautiful red chili that a lot of enchilada sauces are made from. And so I could see that being common in that restaurant for his enchilada sauces. It would make sense. So I decided to go with the Guajillo and Chipotle and some garlic and chicken broth and we're going to do 
a way of making this that's probably different than what might have been done in his restaurant. Most Hispanic people, when they're making a chili sauce, they will take the chilies they want, open them up, and try to get out as many seeds as possible. Um, and then take the chili and boil it. After boiling it for a period of time, they will then take that and pour the chilies and some of the water that was boiled in and put it in a blender and blend it up. They then take that and run it through a strainer to strain out any of the bits of skin or possible seeds that could have gotten in there. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the way they might do that in, in a restaurant. Well, I don't do things that way. I want just a pure chili paste from the inside of the, that, that chili. And so I like to run mine through a food mill and I don't boil my chilies, I slow soak them. That way they kind of puff up slowly. I believe I truly do get a better quality product. So that's what I'm gonna go for. Um, and I'm gonna make a wonderful sauce after I make that chili paste. So there's a little bit of time lapse that we're gonna go through here as we soak those chilies. Uh, we'll take a look at what I have here. We're going to get it measured out. We're going to discuss proportions of ingredients relative to the flavors. So what I'm doing in front of you here is actually reverse engineering a recipe after having tasted it. All right. And uh, I wanted to kind of give you an example of how this is done. The flavors that I tasted, the appearance of the sauce, uh, the common methods used in a restaurant relative to this dish. There's a lot of things that go into reproducing a recipe. And this is all part of it. So the next part is, is proper amounts of the right things. So let's take a look at this stuff and get started there. Come on. <clears throat> Chipotle peppers. This doesn't matter what brand. Okay, but these things are, they're ugly, all right? That's the first thing you need to know. Um, what I'm gonna do, pardon the noise, the packaging noise. What I wanna do, first I have to get this thing zeroed out. There we go. I'm just going to start with a random amount of Chipotle. Okay, that says 1.5 ounces. Now I could be measuring this in grams, and that would probably be better. So how about I switch over to grams, 44. So I'm just taking what I had left in this bag. I'll remove any junk here that I won't use. Well, that's a little ridiculous. Okay. 64 grams. Okay, so what I want to say here is a rough, oh, let's just say a rough 60 grams. 65 grams. <laughs> what do you know? So that gives me a good starting point. <clears throat> Without any way of really knowing exactly get this to zero again exactly how much of the proportions were all I can do is just shoot in the dark the first time guessing from the flavors I perceived however there was no distinct flavor of any one single chili that was predominant so I just got to have to do kind of an even mix Sixty-six. Looky there. That is so close, it's unbelievable. Oh, it went down to 64. Either way, it's workable. Okay, so it needs to be said that even when you're doing that that way, this will produce a different percentage of paste than this will because they're just two different chilies and the inner walls of that chili was 
uh, a different thickness of meat relative to the amount of skin. Okay, so they weigh differently relative to the amount of paste that they make. That having been said, we still work it this way. So I've got an even amount of each chili. And I know how much I started with, 65 grams of each. So I have 130 grams of chilies here total. To that, when I make my paste, I'll look at it and then I'll decide the quantity of garlic I want to use relative to how much chicken broth. And from there, we'll work the recipe out. Now folks, when you do this the first time, you're trying to match the right ingredients. And then after that, you may have to produce the recipe a second or even a third time to balance the ingredients, getting the right amount of this or that. So you may taste this and say, oh, it's too chipotle-y. And so you reduce this by a third or, or something to that effect. And that way you can start balancing your recipe. And that's exactly what I do a lot of times when I'm producing recipes right here. Uh, when I'm inventing new ones, I'll bring balance to it on the, second, uh, on the second shot. And most of the time it only takes two. Now folks, in order to make a sauce, we have to start by getting the pulp on the inside of the chilies to soften up. The only way to do that is to get water to it. And to make that easier, we split them open. Okay, folks, now that you have hot water down in here, ooh, ouch, that hurts. Uh, these are gonna take some time to soak. So I'm just gonna give them time. It's gonna be a couple of hours, and there is no rush on this. Folks, when it comes time to working these chilies, what I'm gonna do is use a food mill. Now you can do this with a blender also. You take the skins of the chilies, wash off the seeds, take away the stems, put those skins down in your blender with some of the chicken broth and blend it up that way. But then you're gonna have to run that through a strainer with a uh, rubber spatula in it. So it's a, in my view, it's a lot of extra work. Doing a food mill like this is so much quicker uh, and it gives you much better results. There we go, that's a little better angle. I wanna take that garlic, I just wanna slice it thin. So I take that, I can wash any seeds off of that. Sometimes they're on there. With a food mill, it doesn't matter, guys. It does not matter at all, because the mill will separate your seeds. Once I have my chilies down in here, I go ahead and just start cranking this paddle. We have our paste made. It is absolutely fantastic looking. Now I'm gonna go ahead and work in some chicken stock. Now I started with a cup and a half. I don't know if I'll need it all. I'm looking for a consistency similar to spaghetti sauce. And this is a little bit on the thick side compared to that. So far I've used a half a cup of this. There, I put in another half. Let's look. Okay, we're starting to get that right consistency. However, if I cook this and steam out some of that moisture, it'll be too thick again. So I'm gonna add in maybe, ooh, another quarter of a cup. Bring this to a boil, lower the temperature, and let it simmer covered. I want that to simmer once it starts coming up to a bubble for about 20 minutes, just to give me some flavor. Now, something else I'm gonna add to it right now, because I know that chilies are salt thirsty. I'm gonna add in a quarter to a half teaspoon of salt. Okay, let's go ahead and get these on the plate. Oh, yes. Camarones Diablo. It's been an interesting day. It's been a lot of fun. Reproducing this recipe, well, wasn't that tough. And I've definitely got exactly what I was going for right here. So, while it may not be dead on exactly what he makes, the flavor is so doggone close that even somebody with a discerning palate, like myself, would find it very difficult to tell the two apart. Maybe if the two were side by side, 
You could taste one and then seconds later taste the other. But I'll tell you what, this is so close. So very close. I can taste the garlic. It's in the background. I can taste that chicken broth. It's in the background also. No distinct chili flavor other than the smokiness of the chipotle. Mm. It's a little hot in here. So here we go. We have taken knowledge gained by learning flavors. We have then applied that knowledge in the form of a beautiful sauce. Cooking the shrimp was really easy. It's just a pan sear and boom, you're up and running. The sauce is the trick. That's the flavor. And in a lot of cooking, it's that way. And if you can learn to reproduce these flavors, these complex flavors where you're combining things to make beautiful sauces, if you can learn to reproduce that, then you've hit the pinnacle of exactly where you need to be. Okay, and that is a good thing. So give this a try. I am going to go and relax a little bit, have a beautiful meal, enjoy eating this, and uh, folks, I'll be back with you in just a little bit, okay? Well, another day has lapsed, and I'm now shooting the final video on this. All right, so that's the reason you keep seeing different clothes. Here's the thing. The Camarones a la Diablo was delicious, all right? The chili sauce came out perfect. And it would be difficult to tell them apart, it really would. Here's an assignment for you. Here's something I would like for you to try. Please, go to one of your favorite restaurants and pick out one of your favorite dishes and dine on that. As you dine on it, think about the flavors, picking each one out. What's the most prominent and what's the next down the list? And what's this and what's a hint of that in the background or whatever and pick those flavors out of that dish go home and try to reconstruct it it's likely you won't get it exactly right the first time but take note of those flavors and in your mind work out a way to get balance between the two did you use too much or too little of something would it help to add some more of whatever so give that a try and see if you can't reproduce some dishes from what you've learned from basically this lesson, which has now turned into four episodes. So this is part number four. Um, so if you've paid attention on these, how to develop your palate, then you've, and, and you've uh, done the exercises, then you have some idea of a lot of different flavors now, and that's probably growing. Something else that's going to happen, and you're going to notice this, the more you develop your palate, the better you get at this, the more you're capable of walking into a place where food is being prepared and being able to say, you're cooking this or that. I was standing outside of our kitchen at work, and I said to one of our chefs, there's beef fat burning. And he said, no, no, we're, we're not cooking with beef. I said, dude, use your nose. There is beef fat burning. And he said, well, I smell something. And I said, it's beef fat burning. Now we go in the kitchen and sure enough, one of the other chefs has the grill turned on and he's burning it off. I said, what's smoking off of that? He said, uh, uh, it depends on what we cooked last. I said, what did you cook last? He said, well, it was hamburgers. And I was like, okay. So we smell smoking beef fat. And um, it, it was, it's, I do this a lot. I'll walk into that kitchen or near that kitchen and I can start saying exactly what's being cooked with or what's being heated, uh, what's happening without actually seeing it or being around it. And that's from the development of the palate. And as you develop your palate, the nose follows that olfactory sense is all tied together and you're going to be able to know what's happening with food based on smell as well. So there's your first exercise, which is pick out a recipe and reverse engineer it. And here's your second exercise. Sometimes in cooking, you'll hear a chef use the word construct to describe a dish that they are serving. Um, 
and this happens rarely, but it does happen. So I'm going to give you an example of a dish deconstructed, and I would like for you to try doing something similar, either with another dish or even with this particular example. In Texas, in Tex-Mex cooking, we have a dish that people absolutely love, and it's good. It's called sour cream chicken enchiladas. It's banging delicious. It's a very tasty dish, and what I'm going to propose is that you take that dish and reproduce it, deconstruct it. So, go to a restaurant that you like and have some sour cream chicken enchiladas. Get that flavor in your head. Get it on the palate. Go home and remake it. Now the way I like doing mine, and I'm going to give you an example here, is I'll take my chicken breast, boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and I'll fry them in a pan. And I cook both sides until they are, are browned and fully cooked all the way through. I'll set those chicken breasts aside, and in that pan, with that fawn and the heat still under it, I'll pour in some salsa verde. And the way I do mine is I use two different salsa verdes, one which is made of jalapenos and the other which is a um, tomatillo with guacamole type salsa verde. Uh, it's a little more creamy. Both of them are sharp and acidic and have a lot of green chilies and uh, that kind of flavor going on in them. Once you put that in the pan, that's going to start deglazing it. Add to that, and, and you want about a half a cup of, of those um, uh, salsa verdes to two breasts being cooked and put in one cup of sour cream on that stir them together it'll break loose that fond cover that pan let it simmer for a few minutes about two or four two to four minutes just enough to get the heat throughout if you'd like you can even dust it with some cayenne it's really tasty folks take that chicken breast that you cook and place it on top of some of that sauce on a plate. Then either have corn chips or corn tortillas steamed and served on the side. And there you have chicken enchiladas with the sour cream sauce all deconstructed. So that's one of the things that chefs like to do is we could take this wonderful dish, the sour cream chicken enchilada, and turn it into this dish over here, which is a whole different thing. And it's easy and fast to make. I did this dish just the other night, and it was so tasty. I was looking for something fresh and new and real easy to make, and something I can do for the show that'll be a fun, fast dish, kind of a weeknight meal. And this is what I came up with. So please, before I even put it out, Give it a try. Go for it. Make that dish. Thank you for watching. This was part four of developing the palate. <clears throat> Excuse me, developing the palate. <laughs> if I learn to talk, it's fun, all right? This is not only great teaching and, and, and a great opportunity to learn, but it's like a great game. It's fun, all right? You might as well enjoy food. It is one of the most intimate things we do. Enjoy it at its fullest and have a good time with it. Thanks for watching this video. Please take a look at Texas Cooking Today with everything else that I have on there. There's a lot of good recipes. If you like what I do, please tell me so. Click that like button. Drop some comments down there. If you like this kind of video or if you have other ideas for similar videos, please drop them in the comments boxes and I'll see what I can come up with. And folks, thank you very much for watching. And please, have a good day. Goodbye.